Hello, good afternoon and welcome uh, to the UK BIM Alliance first event of 2021. I'm uh, Bryn Mannering, uh, uh, work for the BRE, but today I'm in my capacity uh, as a member of the UK BIM Alliance East region. Thanks for coming and we really do hope you enjoy today's event for um, the region. Uh, today's event is digitised or bust digital construction during the pandemic. Um, we're also planning to hold two more, um, at least two more events this year, In uh, one in June in the subject of manufacturing and one in September, October um, uh, on the subject of information management and quality assurance. So we use a GoToWebinar today. Um, you're all in listen-only mode, but if you do have a question, please ask through the Q and questions tab um, that you can see there and we'll have a Q&A session after everyone has presented. Um, do avoid using the raise hand option for questions. And just to let you know that we're recording this session um, and we'll be making it available to view via the UK uh, BIM Alliance YouTube account as soon as we can. So the agenda for today, um, firstly, there's a quick update on what's been happening recently from an, an Alliance perspective. Um, uh, then we're gonna have our uh, first speakers of the day are going to be Adam Davis of RPS and Marcin, uh, apologies, Sokolowski of Willis Brothers Engineering, uh, talking about the A77 Maypole Bypass. Then we've got uh, Jonathan and Steve from MWH Treatment, who will be presenting on how a digital approach has enabled uh, a design for manufacturing based delivery model on the Copper Mills uh, WTW project. Questions will be taken at the end as a panel discussion. No doubt there'll be quite a few. Uh, we'll try to answer as many as we can in that Q&A session, um, but if we don't get round to all of them, um, we'll look to pick them up um, offline later and answer them. So 10 things you need to know about the UK BM Alliance. Um, many of you have seen this before, but it's a, it's a good recap. Um, so to confirm that, that the Alliance is about you. Our work is by the industry uh, for the industry. Um, we've got projects uh, such as the guidance work going on in the background, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and there's also, we've got regional hubs all around the country. Um, there's, uh, if there's one near you, you get in touch. Um, obviously we're here in the East, we're one of them. Or there's been four, the BIM4 groups. Uh, been for housing, many other things, been for design that you can uh, get in touch with and get involved with. Um, they, these are all part of the UK BIM Alliance communities and we're all working together, um, obviously voluntary, um, encouraging support and content and resources to put on events such as this um, to try and keep them a line message of where the, the UK is going in terms with BIM and information management. So everyone, anyone can be involved, do get in touch. So a bit of industry news. Uh, first, we're going to talk about just a quick one on, on the BIM mandate, new BIM mandate. So that, that's come out through the construction playbook, which was released on uh, last year, December the 8th. Um, um, that, it contains a lot of things, uh, not, not just uh, BIM, but what it does is it recognises that the way for um, implementing BIM and information management is through the UK BIM framework. Um, using standards and guidance and other resources um, developed um, as part of the BIM framework and that you will be need, need to adopting standard approaches to things like defining information requirements, generating data, classifying data, information security and data exchange. And, and this is all the subject of the standards uh, that are referred to in the, in the framework and will be growing uh, as, the, as we transition from the old BS and PAS 1192 series type documents across to ISO 19650. There's obviously others in there as well. So some other things that have been happening recently, we've had that just recently, I think last week or the week before, um, we've had a, a, had a release of um, the sixth edition of the uh, uh, 19650 part two guidance. Um, uh, also part three, so parts two, three, and documents A, D, and E. Um, then we also got the uh, release of the um, National Annex, um, and the associate guidance is in there for part two. 
Part three includes more detailed insight from a working group of people with expertise across the asset preparation phase. So that's dealing with IC9650 part three. Um, and it also includes a detailed information management process diagram to support this. Um, guidance part A has now got reference as a matrix of activities carried out to support of the information management function. So that's the information management function assignment matrix, which is re referred to and uh, Appendix A of part two. Um, our, our own Eastern Region member, uh, Andy Bootle, has been uh, involved in that with Rob Jackson. Um, very good piece of work. Also, uh, updates on the information protocol. Um, that was also released last year with some minor changes. Uh, do remember this, this replaces the old CIC BIM protocol. Um, and that old CSC BIM protocol doesn't align with 19650. Um, and these are all available to uh, download from the UK BIM website. Um, also, we've had uh, updates to the National Annex, which has been included in part two, um, and, um, and the Irish National Annex. Um, small bit of information. So we've had the UK Alliance, you may have seen on social media has doing a state of the nation annual survey um, that's to understand the adoption of information management using BIM uh, across the UK built, BIM, uh, built environment. Um, so that, that ended at the end of last week um, so that's going to be collated and the findings are going to be published um, uh, perhaps at the end of this month early next month. Also uh, the UK Alliance has had a, a new appointment um, as uh, a non-executive director of Kath Fontana. Uh, she's the president of the RICS and manager director for projects at Mighty. So it's good to have her on board. Um, we've got a lot of new events, a lot already planned. Um, so there's a lot going on that we'll be able to, to see. So we've got Think BIM, those, that's our Yorkshire and Humber region uh, with events on the 3rd of March, 26th of May, uh, 15th of September and December the 1st. Uh, our Kent region has got events planned 28th of April, 28th of July and 24th of November. And our own BIM region, as I mentioned earlier, we've got some on the 2nd, 2nd of March today, obviously, 17th of June and 30th of September. Um, there's also some wider um, UK BIM, BIM Alliance uh, events. So we've got uh, the UK BIM Alliance Forum and Building Smart and UK Ireland Assemble um, events um, each quarter. The first quarter is going to be one on the 30th of March. Um, and you can go to our website for details to how to join in these events. There we go. So over to our first speakers who are going to be led by um, Adam Davis and Martin Sokolovsky, Wills, Wills Brothers, talking about the A77 Maple Bystos. Over to you. I'm looking forward to a, a good one today. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Bryn. Um, so, as he mentioned, we're here to talk to you about our experience on the A77 uh, Mabel Bypass Scheme. Uh, it's a design and build contract where uh, Wills Brothers um, with a contractor and uh, RPS, uh, an organisation I work for, where uh, the designer they contracted to uh, complete the design for them. Um, like all centrally procured uh, government projects, uh, BIM Level 2 was mandated in the, in the scope, um, so that's what it's being delivered to. So a bit about uh, ourselves, uh, I mentioned I work for RPS, um, I'm a chartered civil engineer, about 10 years experience. Um, I recently completed a higher diploma in BIM uh, that was run by my organisation and um, GMIT in collaboration. Um, on the Mabel uh, bypass scheme, I was the design coordinator or uh, in the BEP uh, defined as the uh, task information manager. Um, if I pass you over to Martin to introduce himself. Thank you, Adam. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Martin Sokolowski. <clears throat> I'm a, a big company BIM manager for Wills Bros right now, so acting as a, as a partner in design and uh, uh, build contract as a general contractor in, in this scope together, cooperating with Adam in, uh, in this contract. Uh, 
few words about my background. I have 15 years experience in construction in different sectors of construction. Uh, 10 years I was working for uh, global uh, construction company Skanska and then also in a few other companies uh, delivering uh, different uh, projects. Since 2009 I was responsible for implementing and introducing, developing a BIM concept in uh, uh, Poland and of course uh, cooperating with our global uh, branches across uh, Europe and uh, in US also. So I was also traveling and working in some different geographies uh, in Europe uh, in BIM. <clears throat> so I can say that uh, my experience in BIM is quite uh, uh, quite uh, long and also I'm a BSI auditor uh, responsible for delivering certification uh, in BIM. So this is uh, this is my additional uh, task. Uh, I also uh, was engaged in a project of setting up uh, branch standards in Poland. Uh, the project is called BIM Standard PL, uh, where all the key players in, in construction market join forces like uh, similarly to UK BIM Alliance and try to develop something uh, that will be the foundation to, to run change in digital construction. So uh, I'm very pleased to be with you and looking forward to have a good session. I Thanks, give uh, the voice to Adam. Yeah. Thanks, Martin. Um, so a bit about the project, I suppose, first. Um, so Mabel is a town about 60 kilometers south of uh, Glasgow. Um, as you'll guess from the title of the project, it's a uh, bypass around the town, around the west of the uh, town. So it's about five and a half kilometers of a single carriageway. Uh, three at grade roundabouts, uh, numerous side roads and junctions. There are seven major structures, two over bridges, two under bridges, and uh, three major um, box culvert structures, numerous other culverts, uh, culvert extension. And then there's all the other works um, that are associated with trunk road projects like drainage, uh, road restraints, traffic signs, lighting, uh, communications ducts, all, all, all the usuals, um, which did make for extremely congested verges uh, in the uh, at the side of the carriageway. So there's a lot of a lot of information, and uh, yeah, just made very very congested verges. So we're going to show um, a two minute video of our federated model, uh, which incorporates all the uh, individual designs and models of each task team. So I'm going to play that next. It's two minutes long. Of course, what you see is the end result of, of the work, but uh, getting here was uh, was a quite uh, challenging journey for us. So maybe Adam can comment on that, how we got to this point. Yeah, I mean, um, I suppose it's uh, with design and build contracts, there uh, there's always an aggressive program um, where the con contractor wills wants to get uh, on the ground as quickly as possible. So it really was kind of a, a sequential um, certification of different elements of the design. Um, but whilst making sure that uh, any design that's going to be completed uh, further down the line uh, isn't impacted by the design that you're currently um, completing. So uh, clash avoidance was absolutely integral to, to everything that we did. Um, as you can see here on the screen, uh, it's just a, a, sm a small example of um, where we would have completed uh, ITS duct, uh, the ITS design, and then the traffic signs uh, design would follow. And um, we would uh, maneuver the ITS duct to avoid the, um, the traffic sign, as you can see there. Yeah, thanks for sticking with us. Um, so uh, 
I suppose uh, another major element of the uh, the project was just about how we manage uh, the information on it, because there's there's just an incredible amount of information, and we need to ensure that I suppose everyone's singing off the same hymn sheet, and uh, everyone on site is using the latest uh, version of the drawings. Everyone in the design team is using the latest version of the drawings, so they're cognizant of of everything that's going on around them in there. So no one's designing in a little silo. Um, so the way we, I suppose, part of this process is using the TIDP, which will tell you um, the latest version of every single document that's available. Um, the example up on screen there is the pavement drawing. Um, oh, sorry, uh, of pavement drawings and documents. Uh, I suppose the way I think of the TIDP, it's a kind of uh, built like Lego from the uh, register of uh, fields and codes where it will tell you kind of the location of each of the um, the element you're designing and the type of document. So yeah, it's 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 all all built um, to ensure there's no duplicates of any any drawings um, or documents. So a bit on uh, kind of clash avoidance that I was touching on whilst the uh, video was was running there. Um, a couple of examples here are. Um, the top one you can see there is a road, uh, sorry, a um, ITS stuck that clashed with a drainage um, manhole, uh, and the bottom one is a road restraint uh, foundation and a uh, manhole, a drainage manhole. So it's just about the process of identifying these clashes before they make it into the construction drawings, and uh, I suppose moving them um, to ensure that clashes clashes don't occur, which can be costly, wasting contract the time and resources um, to, to really avoid rework. Um, as I was mentioning, uh, in the nature of design and builds, uh, there is a, a the program, the design program is very sequ sequential. So um, the designer, sorry, the contractor would often have certain elements built. Um, so whilst we're always aiming for the most efficient and um, most efficient design and cost effective design, sometimes that involves uh, changing the design that you've previously certified um, to make it but also ensuring or hasn't already been built. Um, about the CD, uh, Common Data Environment, that we used on the project, uh, we used BIM 360. Um, we used it to submit the designs. The contractor used it to uh, complete design reviews. Um, it was also used as a tool on site. So um, the contractor would raise material acceptance reports and requests for inspection of works to our site team, which uh, all had use, all made use of uh, BIM 360. So it was, it was all automated. So, so nothing, nothing was missed. It's just a, a really good means of uh, communication. So my, my final slide before I pass you over to Margin, um, the contractor um, procured a point cloud of, um, of the scheme. So it would take uh, levels across the site, uh, I think on a two weekly or monthly uh, basis. And um, we were able to integrate that into our model to kind of verify levels and uh, I suppose check, check um, how, the, how the construction's coming on. And also, if elements did need changing, we were able to quickly see what what was completed on on site. Um, so yeah, it's, it it can be a very powerful tool, and uh, it it really does show progress well of um, of what the contractors completed. Um, I'll pass you over to Marcin now. Thanks for. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Uh, Adam will uh, support me in uh, technically in, in slide changing. Uh, yes. The, probably the main challenge for us as a general contractor in civil engineering sector was uh, tying up few elements together because uh, probably we uh, at the moment where we started we won two out of four biggest projects in uh, Scotland where BIM was uh, BIM compliant contracts uh, if I'm right 100% which means that we were uh, under pressure of delivering uh, projects to to the highest standard in BIM. Uh, also, uh, uh, being, uh, I would say, prepared to uh, cooperate effectively with our partner designer, lead designer, uh, in this case, RPS. Who, uh, so, so we not only uh, were focused in, internally of having all the processes and procedures 
uh, fully compliant with BIM, but also uh, having the proper communication channels, information exchange channels with our partners. So this was, of course, uh, a lot of work uh, in preparing this element. And we have different perspectives. Uh, I found this, uh, this graphic somewhere uh, to show uh, which elements were uh, uh, considered because it was all about the market elements, uh, relations with clients, with our uh, supply chain and partners who were engaged in, uh, in uh, our cooperation with, with BIM elements uh, in place. Uh, business partners. Of course, uh, we were looking on the wider scope of project uh, life cycle because we had design element and execution element up to handover and of course we look for a guarantee period uh, as well. And uh, we are a company that is really looking uh, after sustainable elements. So I think that in this regard, this is very, very important to uh, to track and monitor every element of your construction in this aspect. So all this uh, technology that is here uh, named Construction Industry 4.0, uh, we were considering seriously to put in place and uh, I can say that few of these elements were, were successfully implemented, which is of course the, the beginning of our digital journey, but uh, proved in operation sector that this is worth to do. Adam, if we can uh, change the slide for the next one. Thank you. And of course, in terms of uh, requirements, we were uh, looking on the wider perspective of different elements. First, uh, processes, people and technology. These three things, I, I think, are the key ones to, to successfully deliver BIM. And of course, outside of it, what's some kind of a policy, BIM policy that we built uh, among top management of wheels and this was in extremely important that uh, it uh, came straight from the top management that we want to have BIM in place and we want to focus on improving operations. So not only fulfilling formal requirements to be BIM compliant but also going a few steps further and uh, introduce uh, numerous solutions, technical solutions competence, skills among staff to have a better uh, efficiency in operations and to have visible efficiency in operations. And of course standards, this is the element that we wanted to keep in mind because uh, we are, uh, I would say, well-organized organization uh, which together with Irish uh, headquarter uh, counts around 500 employees, so this is not, uh, not so small company. Uh, at the end of the day and uh, I have to admit that uh, whenever I joined Wales organization I was really uh, positively uh, positively uh, amused or uh, I would say uh, aware that uh, that uh, this organization really is processed focused so so this was very very good uh, and uh, having these three top elements like processes people and technology of course in processes we needed to develop numerous process processes workflows templates elements that are typically beam uh, compliant and apply them into working system technology was all about software and additional tools that we use like mobile devices, like drones, like uh, any other uh, scanners that we use on a daily basis. And then uh, finally we had people, so changing the mindset and the culture, how we cooperate, how we look after things and how we can uh, deliver them in a different way. So this was quite a big change in terms of the culture aspect, how people will react on that. Can we change please? For next slide. Yes, and looking even deeper, we had our uh, process system where IP062 is uh, our uh, BIM management area. So, so we name it exactly starting from BIM policy into BIM processes and then we had procedures, forms and guidance. All this that existed in the, let's say, traditional projects has to be, had to be changed and revised uploaded, improved into the new new BIM compliant way. So uh, there was extra work done, but uh, the result was that not only we had up-to-date latest 
changes that we uh, applied in, but also we tried to comp uh, tie it up with technology. So having uh, BIM360 as our common data environment and having additional system when we source information and we uh, sync information with BIM360 and other way around, we were able to prepare the right forms, the right structures, so it could be all uh, run digitally uh, and it was all tied together. So it was uh, built like a one bigger system, not only separate bits of elements, but it was, uh, I would say, designed to be a one system. Okay, if we can move forward. Uh, yes, and of course uh, we tried to formalize the process uh, and we needed to, to think how to make it efficient uh, on, especially on BIM projects. So, so this was this was number one priority. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, mobility. Yes, uh, I mentioned common data environment uh, the, and improving operations, having this visible uh, positive result on operations. We introduced numerous uh, checklists, numerous templates where we started to fill in and sign off digitally on site. Uh, especially in pandemic uh, uh, time when, when we started to have these lockdowns and limited uh, access to our construction site, uh, we discovered that this element started to spread up significantly among uh, individuals and uh, people who were not fully, uh, fully uh, how to say, convinced to use the, the technology. Uh, it, it really helped us to, to move this, uh, spread it forward, implement it uh, much uh, stronger. And also we could even improve and uh, make the, these electronic forms and, and uh, documents workflows more efficient because then we were fully reliant on this system. So it was even next step uh, done quicker than we probably expected as a natural way of, of evolution uh, based on the fact that Pandemia uh, built the environment we needed to, to work in. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can uh, move, Adam. Uh, yes. And of course, uh, having this these two big projects in, uh, in Scotland, I mean Mabel Bypass and uh, Gaia, which is a uh, Glasgow industrial area next to the airport, uh, which is also a BIM compliant project for Renfrew Shire Council. Uh, we uh, started to create our own uh, own strategical, uh, I would say, strate strategically important goals, and we uh, introduced pilot projects that are done on uh, specific elements of of uh, of the BIM scope. Uh, so we had dedicated teams and uh, dedicated resource and, and a piece of project uh, for 4D and 5D uh, delivered. And simultaneously, uh, we started to also have our internal preparation to deliver even higher standard of these two elements on the future projects. So, so we started to, to develop our in-house competence. And I can say that we successfully trained um, around, I would say, a few. It's probably too little, too 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 little uh, individuals in in uh, BIM skills. So so we started to improve these uh, competence among our staff, and I have to say we have quite strong in-house uh, team to deliver uh, scope in BIM. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we can move forward. And this was the final uh, final uh, step that we've taken. Having these two projects quite advanced and having all these things in place, having numerous things done together of, also with our partner RPS uh, and, uh, and having this uh, in-house competence strongly developed, we started to think about certification. Uh, because we were so advanced in practical aspect, we decided to go directly to BIM KiteMark, uh, BSI KiteMark, 
and we successfully uh, got it uh, last year. This year we had red certification, and I had to admit that it was very good because we had uh, non -con zero non-conformities, only some areas for improvement. So, so it was uh, very very good. Uh, after one year of holding the kite mark certificate, we proved that uh, we are still on this continuous uh, development in BIM, and hopefully this also enables us to to put up the the i would say the goals higher than than uh, than previously and also it was quite good uh, element to uh, how to say mobilize mobilize different parts of the organization to to start thinking in a bim way which which was really extra extra support for us uh, applying for for this certification so this was the 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 journey we we had uh, and of course i'm looking forward for any questions uh, at the end session which is going to take place probably within uh, an hour or so yeah thank you that's probably the last slide of mine thanks yeah. very much as well Thanks very much, Adam and Marcin, for that very interesting presentation. Um, we're now handing over to Jonathan May and Steve Kennedy from MWH Treatment um, to do their presentation on um, the Copper Mills project. Johnny, we we. Yeah, that's it. There we go. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, great presentation earlier. Nice, nice to see tools being used in the field um, in in other sectors. We're here to talk about um, use of digital tools in the water sector. So, um, quick introduction about MWH treatment. MWH treatment is an integrated design build contractor. Um, that works solely in the water sector. Um, we have frameworks from Scotland through the spine of the country um, through to, to southern water. We've got a revenue of around about 200, 250 million um, pounds per annum and, and have about a thousand employees. Uh, we have a self delivery arm, but a, a lot of our work is delivered through our supply chain. Um, my role in that, I'm head of digital and innovation, um, but really it's a, a change management role, um, a, a process we've been working at and, and driven by the regulator. We have a sort of a five year funding cycle in the water sector um, and each five years we, uh, the sector is targeted with these efficiency challenges. Um, we were just moving into called what's called AMP7, uh, which is the seventh five-year period since privatization of the sector and the efficiency challenge that, that we're faced with this time is is another 20 percent which is clearly a challenge um, we have to work out how to deliver um, the outcomes that, that our clients the water companies need um, for for significant efficiency and, and one of our primary areas that we look at um, as, a, as a design build contractor in that is productive efficiency, so pre-construction um, and delivery efficiency when we, we get onto site. And really for, for us, um, digitization is, is all about enabling a, a different approach to the way that we deliver projects on site. Um, and what we're really seeing is a, a shift in our, our delivery model and our, our site model from one where we have skilled people at solving problems um, to one where it's all about precision delivery on site, uh, where we are using DFMA, we're using templating designs and, and our site activities are much more about integrating those packages together in the most efficient way as possible. Um, we've been working, working digitally for about seven years now. Um, we started off with a, a program, an initial Pathfinder project, then we introduced Pathfinders in each of our regions, and, and now we're, we have um, established a way of working. It's about converting all of our projects to a digital approach. Um, what we've really, really learned through that process um, is that 
to be successful in its deployment, it needs to be um, driven by our delivery teams. We really need to be providing digital tools to help them in the delivery of projects on the ground. So we, we talk about creating the pool from delivery. So how can we use tools to support those delivery teams in terms of getting the assets into the ground, managing the interfaces, between our subcontractors, managing the interfaces between our new assets and the client's assets and the handover. Um, we as a business have, have standardized on a set of core digital tools. I'd love for them to, to, to spell out the initial SMART, but unfortunately it doesn't quite fit its SAMRAT. Um, so really what we talk about as our core tools now is we survey uh, all of the assets predominantly with with laser scans, but for some of our smaller projects, it might just be with with 360 cameras. Um, from those uh, surveys, we create 3D models. Um, from the 3D models, we then move into uh, a phase of rehearsing the activity, so reversing uh, rehearsing the delivery, um, rehearsing the construction, um, then. Once we've gone through those rehearsals, got all of those issues sorted out, we move into the assemble phase. So really moving away from the work construction into assembly. And then finally transfer. So using digital field management tools to, to collect all of the information to hand it over to our client. Um, the digital strategy really forms two streams or our digital tools form two streams. One is about visualization. Um, and, and visualization, augmented reality, virtual reality, 3D modeling, really, really important to get engagement from all stakeholders because if you're, you're, you're being more um, productive and intense in your site activities, that means that you really do need a design approval um, and design sign off by the client before you get to the site because change is very, very costly, both in terms of money and time. Um, so the, the, the visualization is really important. And then capturing and using data analytics uh, to really inform the decision making, the decisions that we're making. So final, final thing from me before you, you see on the, the copper mills project, how all of this came together, what, what we're really focusing through that process is, is how can we decouple the program? So typically construction projects have a, a fairly linear um, critical path through them. What we're really focusing through the digital tools is is how we can have uh, as many activities are operating concurrently at the same time as possible. So collaborative planning rehearsals are key. Um, and, and then really like, like in the earlier presentation, focusing on the, the interface management between the scope items. So enough from me, I'll leave, leave Johnny to introduce himself and, and then give a presentation of how this all, all came together on the, the Copper Mills projects. Thank you. Great, thanks Steve. Can you hear me okay? I'll take that as a yes. Um, so, um, yeah, as Steve said, my name is Johnny May, I'm a mechanical engineer at NWH Treatment. Um, I think Steve's given a really a, a good overview of the sort of um, toolbox that we've got and the processes that we've got in place to implement digital tools on our projects. Um, and sort of what I hope to bring out through this presentation is an example of how those tools have provided real value in both time money and in terms of keeping our our people safe um so probably the best way to introduce you to the project is to show you um a clip from the project vpi or visual project initiation um so this is effectively um something that we used in part of our site inductions to demonstrate what we're trying to achieve what plant we're trying to build and how that plant will operate um so the scope here included three raw, raw water pumping stations which take water out of uh, the Copper Mills Main which runs from a number of reservoirs in northeast London. These three raw water pumping stations um, would then feed the rapid gravity filters which you can see on the screen there so that's a, a 12 filter um, block each of those containing dual media so sand and anthracite as a primary filtration for the water to the, um, to the site. So that media is then cleaned every sort of 12 hours via a backwash tank and a backwash pumping system. And then the project also uh, covered all the interconnecting pipe work between these assets and um, the upgrade to the power and control infrastructure. Um, all of that lot was in the middle of a really tight congested site um, in zone two in London. 
um, which obviously presents a whole host of challenges. So initial estimates suggested that that build that you've just seen there um, would cost us about £42 million and it would take us around three years to build. Um, and then underpinned by our digital strategy, which we'll go through in a second, we did some DFMA and the result is that we um, shaved 12 million off that estimate, delivered it in 30 million in around half of the time. So how on earth has that been achieved? Well, as, as I said at the start, it all started with our digital strategy, which really drove the DFMA approach. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, DFMA um, means design for manufacture and assembly. So the idea is that you build all of your components off site in the safety of a quality controlled factory environment and then deliver everything to site and assemble it like Lego. So you take that construction risk away from the site environment to a factory environment. Um, so our sort of DFMA journey for this project was that we started off um, to make room for that RGF block, we had to relocate an existing Thames Water workshop. Um, so this video shows a 4D simulation uh, against the time lapse of the build. We effectively put a flat pack workshop up. And this building was delivered and installed in just two and a half days. Um, the next area that we moved on to was um, the prefabricated um, base for um, the reinforcement cages. So those reinforcement cages you can see on the screen um, were made up into, um, I think there was 12 sections in total, which were lifted off the back of a lorry and dropped onto site. So the reinforcement for the base for the whole RGF structure was installed in just 10 days, which was a four week saving on site time. And um, the RGF structure itself was built from a post tension precast system. Um, so we had just over 310 wall panels, and a 50 meter pipe gallery which contained 15 22 ton sections and we'll touch on this in a little bit more detail afterwards um, inside the filter on the right hand side there as you can see the distribution channels um, which feed backwash water to and from the filters and collect filtered water and deliver it out to the, uh, the next phase of the process so these were prefabricated from stainless steel and delivered in two sections each taking one week on site to drop it in and uh, fix it down and weld the intermediate section. The inlet and outlet backwash pipe manifolds were delivered in six separate modules, three on each side of the, the um, filters. Each of those was prefabricated to contain all of the valves, actuators, flow meters, cabling, lighting, and walkways. Now, the key challenge when you're doing a DFMA project like that and building everything off site is that all of those pieces don't fit together unless you've meticulously planned out um, how it's going to be installed and you've methodically designed um, them all to fit together well. So really key to that way of thinking is our digital strategy. So before we put a spade in the ground, as Steve touched on earlier, we laser scan all of our sites. So we have certainty over the interfaces that we have with existing structures. Designs were then built around a federated 3D model which integrated all of our subcontractor um, models to detect clashes between subcontractors early. We used augmented reality to engage Thames Water operations and enable them to visually see where we are planning to install the new equipment. And then we can get their input on um, those designs before anything is started to be built in the factory. We used 4D synchro installation simulations. So these are effectively a digital visual version of the program. And um, we use these to facilitate uh, monthly collaborative planning meetings where we'd have designers, um, supervisors, commission engineers, subcontractors and the client all in the same room working around this delivery program, trying to optimize it together and collaboratively, which isn't doable without the visual tools in, in that way. Um, I think at one point we ended up even showing one of these to a local resident who was worried about uh, construction traffic on her road so we could show her what was coming when it was coming and give her that sort of um, certainty of that you know that we, we had it in control. Um, before things were delivered to site we used uh, AI validation um, so this was to verify that the DFMA equipment was built to design prior to delivery 
so we can mitigate any rework on site. And then finally, um, we use BIM 360 field for all of our site diaries, reporting um, and check sheets for a fast quality controlled handover. Now, at the start of the job, we didn't have um, a, a big fully functioning team of digital whiz kids to use these tools and build this project. In fact, we had these guys. So all of the, them are really experienced and technically brilliant, but a lot of the time, you know, some of the older guys fin struggle finishing and hitting their timesheets, never mind embracing the digital tools on offer. So what we did is we gave them um, the right tools, we gave them some iPads, and we gave them the augmented reality gear, and we gave them me and Ben and um, at the top right hand corner. So Ben and I were uh, obviously a bit younger, we understand the technology and we're comfortable in using it. So in addition to our day jobs, we were able to provide training and support to the site team, as well as the delivery team providing training and support to us in the more technical aspects and provide their experience to us as well. So it was kind of a two way learning approach, which worked really well. Um, by the end of the job, Andy on the left hand side there, um, when it came to site diaries, he was managing all of the contemporary records for the site digitally um, and filling those in in BIM 360 field, which was really invaluable for the commercial team. Um, Don, the next guy along, um, he realised he could save himself the hassle of red penning wet drawings out in the rain and mark those up on his iPad. Um, Steve uh, really embraced 4D Synchro and he thought it was brilliant because he didn't need to explain all his ideas about how to drive the programme forward to everyone. All he had to do was play a video that we could help him put together and everyone in the room had cohesive understanding of what he was trying to achieve. Um, and Nishil on the right hand side there, he's managing the project handover at the moment. And he's probably the digital, biggest digital advocate that you'll find. Now we've all disbanded, the delivery team have moved on to different projects. He doesn't need to go trawling back through sheets and sheets of paper to find commissioning records or asset data sheets because he can do all of that from the records on his iPad. Now, I just want to touch on um, a couple of areas which kind of really demonstrate how that digital approach has given tangible rewards. So the first is the precast structure. And just on the screen there is a, is a little time lapse of that going in. And so you can see the wall sections being dropped in um, or precast via the crane there. And then um, the walkways on top. Then there's a period of post tensioning and um, grouting in the joints. So based on traditional methods, we originally had 39 weeks in our civils program um, to build that structure. Um, with the DFMA approach, we had no on-site coring, no steel fixing, no shuttering, and um, the result was that we built it in 18 weeks. That's a 55% program reduction. In terms of vehicle movements, the precast method reduced 342 concrete loads down to 124 precast deliveries, which gave us a 40% reduction in embodied carbon and 64% reduction in vehicle movements. Um, if built in situ, uh, the original estimate was that you need 65 labourers on the job for a build that size. In this case, we have five guys and um, just tensioning up the, um, the precast. And at no point did any of those five need to carry out any working at height, um, which certainly contributed to the um, zero accident record for the project. The next area I want to just touch on is the pipe gallery installation. Now, these modules, as I said before, distribute the um, raw water to the filters, filtered water out the filters and backwash water to backwash the media and make sure it's all clean. Now, these were manufactured off site in three separate sections um, or three separate sections for each side. And each of those contained all of the pipe work, the valves, flow meters, actuators, walkways. Um, and then we went one step further and did, um, we actually electrically installed, did the electrical installation offsite as well. So there's instrument backboards on there, control panels, cabling, lighting, and then obviously the, the hand railing that you can see. Now, the biggest challenge with the design and install here was really the interfaces. Um, and digital was absolutely critical in overcoming these. When you're trying to interface a, a rigid precast structure to a rigid pipe module that's been factory built, there isn't a lot of room for flexibility. And um, so what we did was laser scan the as-built civil structure uh, after it had been built on site. 
and then laser scan the pre-assembled modules over in the factory where they were being built in Ireland. And then we were able to digitally map those two onto each other. And we ran it through um, a piece of software called SY, which identifies um, any areas that are out of tolerance and highlights those in red. So the team were then able to add a bit of additional flexibility, which was needed and hadn't originally been allowed before, to enable those two um, interfaces to line up perfectly when it was delivered to site. And therefore, there was no rework at site. The second stage of managing that interface was around the 4D planning. Um, so we meticulously planned that installation using 4D synchro in a collaborative environment. So on the screen, what you can see now is just a snippet from that 4D plan, which details so almost by the hour what deliveries were coming, where the laydown areas were, um, what traffic's moving where, where the crane's being sat. Um, you just see there, it's now left and over. Though each of those modules was delivered, so there's three three sections effectively, but each formed a top and bottom. Um, so that's the bottom being lifted off a, a wagon now, and then the top's lifted on top. So it's broken down that way just for sort of transport height reasons. And then you'll see in a second, each of those is lifted snugly in to um, the pipe galleries. Just like that. Now, it's a little bit from a, a different angle. Um, but this is how that looked in real life. So that's the top and bottom going on top of each other and being lift as per the 4D plan. So looking at the costs and the outturn costs for the DFMA installation in this case, just for the pipe modules, was actually a couple of hundred grand higher than a site installation. However, when you factor in the program savings, the original pipe gallery was planned to take around 30 weeks before we, we really drove the DFMA approach. And then through that DFMA and digital process, we reduced that down to just two weeks. So one week for each gallery, and that saved us a million pounds in prelims. And that's in addition to all the unquantifiable, benefit, uh, unquantifiable benefits of um, to health and safety of having that planned off-site install where it's just a simple lift in. So the last piece I want to touch on in this presentation before I play you a nice video is um, operations engagement. But there aren't too many crazy stats for this one, but without the digital tools here, we might still be commissioning the plant. Now, Copper Mills produces about a third of London's water supply. So the operations team um, on the client side in this case were really, really cautious when it came to planning any works on existing assets. So I remember one of the pieces of work that came in um, here was uh, hot taps into the existing mains for those raw water pumping stations. And um, that piece of work blew way out of proportion in terms of getting that signed off. It went way up into Thames senior management for something really was quite routine. Um, so we sort of learned from that experience. And then from that, we, we lean far more heavily on the digital tools to give operations a level of confidence in what we were doing when it came to commissioning and when it came to managing plant shutdowns and integration of the new plant with the old. So on the screen now is a 4D visualization of the commissioning um, sequence just for the first um, uh, of the 12 RGF cells. Um, and through these videos, we sort of demonstrated to the clients exactly which valves will be used for isolations, what sampling regimes will be in place, and how the plant will be brought online. And through this, uh, these sort of tools, the, the operations team really started to engage with us as a contractor a lot more closely. They engaged with the videos, they started to contribute to ideas um, that maybe neither them or our team would have thought about otherwise. Um, so just to summarise the sort of journey we've been on, I know that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, key takeaways really for me on this project were that we agreed the deli uh, digital delivery philosophy early. So we had the toolbox that Steve's been through and we said, yeah, we are going to maximise the use of those tools on this project. We then engaged supply chain partners who were digitally um, uh, you know, prepared for this sort of project and had the right tools and could feed into those digital techniques that we talked about and who were able and willing to get on board early. Um, so we ended up giving PSCs to some of these guys so they could do some of the initial design thinking way at a far earlier stage than we normally would. So we nailed that um, before anything starts to get built. Um, 
we digitally facilitated collaborative um, pr approach throughout the build. So every month there were those collaborative planning meetings facilitated by the 4D Synchro plans um, and all of the visual tools we've been through so that we iron out those interfaces and make sure things fit when they land at site. We had the right team. We had a team who embraced the tools and when they didn't, we gave them the support and the training to do so. And the result is that we maximized DFMA and that obviously has its whole host of benefits. So we've got the 18 month program reduction, 12 million pounds saving on the original LBE, 95% reduction in working at height because we had no roof shuttering, and no wall shuttering, no steel fixing at high level. All the handrail for the um, offsite structures were pre-fitted, so there was no one installing handrail and, and being clipped on at high level. And um, 40% carbon reduction, and then there was no temporary works, no site curing time, and therefore zero accidents. So that's my bit. If we've got time, um, I'd like to play a little video. It's about six seven minutes long um which sort of captures the the client's view on what we did and the build here and how we sort of work together and how those digital tools um facilitated that so I'll just work out how to play it This is a lovely job to kind of finish on, really. Uh, I'm not quite ready for retiring, but this job will stand in my memory for a long time. So your trip from the classroom to the coal face, so to speak, is it a baptism of fire? It's been incredible. We think about it, we came here, what, May 2017. The backbone of what we've done, everything from when we first got here, you got the workshop. Now we've just finished the tarmac in. We're about to leave. We've got maybe a couple months left and it will all be finished. It's just outstanding to think of what's been done in the last two and a half years. different sorts of challenges wasn't there really so there was like trust challenges yeah. with different stakeholders there was timing with different types of raw water that the process site uh, had challenges against all these things presented many challenges didn't they they did because we got a linear view of how we wanted to build it without really taking into account what you needed as Thames Water yeah. and, 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 and the other factors that were going to impact on our delivery and we'd yeah. not really understood the the impact of those Looking back, I think the challenges have become more difficult technical challenges, but the solution has become easier to resolve. Yeah. So if you look back perhaps at the high lift pumps, which are the first ones, that seemed to almost grow out of all proportion, certainly to me, as of, of what the risk, the risk was. Mm -hmm. And it was going up to high level within Thames Water to get approval. Um, and we were getting a lot of inertia from the guys on Thames simply because they didn't fully understand what we were doing and to be fair we did, probably didn't really understand the impact of what we were doing on on them where things started to become easier was when we started to perhaps be clearer about exactly what we needed to do and i think that was kicked off with that, those workshops that that you yeah. instigated i think it was a real sort of start of a real two-way communication yeah. rather than you sort of trying to force your work through yeah and having restrictions there yeah. it became more of a team it did 
the team environment much more so then. Yeah. And then we was able to get a lot of the work done and share ideas about how to get some of that stuff done as well. we needed to switch off significant elements of the process. Our first stab on the programme was, I think, a four-week outage. So we then had to think again, all right, what is the real issue here? Um, and then I think a few of us went and sat in a room with the, 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 the process guys and said, what can you do differently? We looked at that and thought, right, we could actually do it over seven days with breaks in between. Uh, everybody seemed more happy with that idea, so we tweaked the design again to allow us to do it in, in, a, in a number of days. The operator were actually working with us very closely to be able to get the tanks drained down as fast as we could and filled back up as quick as we could. We've got the process scientists that were really monitoring everything and, 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 and extending their initial duration as long as they felt it could. They initially said, well, you've got to be back, on, back online at three o'clock. They said, well, you've got another hour. Well, okay, we, you've got another hour and a half. And it just gave us that little bit extra. The technology-wise has been great on this project. Somebody brought some kit down and we put the screens on the guys, guys and they went down into the uh, high lift pump station and were able to walk around and see the cool, new and the old. The VR for me was like a, a trip into space. I'd never seen anything like it before in my life. Seeing it first hand through the pictures like it's actually there just gives you a, such a good understanding of what it actually will look like once it's finished. I think it really worked. It helped people see where the, the valves and everything are going to be. Yeah. So it did help them understand. Must have helped with people's buying yeah. to it as well yeah. and yeah. Yeah. Like understanding of it. Understand that at that stage there'd been a lot of things thought through and, it, and, and issues that were raised during that walkthrough were then fed back to the designers and they incorporated those in and designed out the risks. Designed out the problems. A lot of people, you know, the, the youngsters pick it up quickly, but us older ones mm. take longer to assimilate, yeah. never mind understanding it, you've yeah. just got to try and understand what it does. Um, and, and you do need that assistance, but at the same time, we can let it, it can run away with itself. So it's, it's getting the balance between fit for purpose and being gold-plated, unnecessarily yeah. gold-plated. Yeah. I guess one of the things that I'm most proud of out there is, is the health and safety record that we've, we've had. We've got oh, something like 920 days without yeah. an incident, which I think is, is really good. And the other thing I suppose is, is the way that we've integrated with, with OPS, the health and safety guys in OPS. I'm going to probably take more from this job than you will, actually. I think the advancements will be faster, quicker for your working life rather than they were for me. As I said, we constructed walls like that for the last 40 years. Seeing it done the other way, you, you'll always learn something new. Over the two, two and a half years that I've been on site with you, I think I've learned 
enormous amounts, like untold amounts. The achievement has been incredible. Just under three years and we've managed to supply an extra 200 MLD per day into people in East, East and North London. Thanks. Thanks for that, um, Johnny and Stephen. Very, um, very good presentation of, of digital done well um, reaps massive benefits um, to all. Um, I'm going to quickly go into the Q and A session now, just conscious of time. So if I can ask the other, uh, if I can ask Adam and, and Martin to come back on on camera, um, so we can. Go through our Q&A. Thanks, everyone. So first question um, has come in. Um, how has BIM assisted stakeholders in this pandemic, such as the client, architects, engineers, contractors, on-site teams, etc.? cetera? Um, Adam, can I ask your views on that first? Um, I suppose uh, one of the key things is um kind of signing off works, approvals. Um, when 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 you're on site, everything's automated, again, through iPads, uh, using BIM 360. So all, all these requests come through to you digitally. You're not, you're not passing around a bit of paper, um, signing off on everything. Um, it's clear where the, where the inspection is, what it is, what you're looking at. And um, so I suppose uh, in these times, uh, minimizing contact, that's a, that's a big benefit and then I suppose this the CDE again it's um just having access to to everything um that's uh every single person in client um designer contractor has access to everything on on BIM 360 but a, lo a lot of these you should you know we haven't changed them because of the pandemic it's just uh, it's just good process um anyway so Thanks, Adam. Uh, Stephen, Jonathan, any views on that? Well, I, I think much what Adam said. I think one of the other benefits that we have seen is we've been able to do our, our check audits, um, checking off the, the, the safety, the environmental, the quality documentation so that when our auditors have gone to site, um, it's been there more around the behavioural aspects, looking at the, the safe working practices, actually how it's operating on the site. So it, having that information available digitally uh, enables those auditors to, to, to under, uh, undertake the sort of bureaucratic element of their work off site, away from risk. And then when they are on site, it is about the behaviours and, and, and ensuring that we are, are working in a, in a um, safe, socially distanced way. Um, so it's, it's, it really helped, but but it, again, it's COVID has has highlighted some of the benefits. But whether COVID was there or not, it is a way of working that drives benefits and efficiencies. Anyhow, um, one of the other areas that we we have looked at, which has been quite interesting in in our rehearsals, is we have started to include, especially where we've been working indoors, um, numbers of. Um, uh, workers in the areas and just dropping people into those rehearsals and being able then to say right we've got x number of people how are we going to come in how are we going to go out so we've been able to to rehearse that that working methodology um and, and social distancing as as well as rehearsing the activities themselves okay thanks thanks for that Stephen. so um what level of engagement have you found uh, smes in providing bim designs and details and participating in in the cde and digital in inspections um johnny if i come to you first on this one level of engagement of what smaller smaller companies yeah smaller to medium enterprises i, I think we do have to and steve feel free to jump in be aware 
of the limitations of, of some contractors over others and uh, we have, go through a procurement process certainly in in our region anyway where we will we will do background checks on things like their digital capabilities their capability to provide things like 3d modeling services and um, work in the type of you know quality assurance processes through cdas that cda so that we we would expect of ourselves um, and we do sort of do that due diligence piece on the um the supply um, supply chain contractors that we that we um, partner with. Um, I don't know, Steve, if you've probably been yeah, well, one of the areas, and I think you you sort of touched on it on the copper mills. It's the identify ent identification of the critical supply chain partners um, and working with those. So there there are generally two levels of of engagement. What we have found is is generally um, once you get over that barrier of working in a different way once you identify what the benefits are to the organizations in terms of time travel and over documentation at the end um, people come on board very quickly but that that long-term um, evolution of way of working is is something that will take years um, what we did in in the last time was um, we we spotted the um the the design for manufacturing assembly was an area where um, there was great opportunity but um at the same time it needed a different approach both from ourselves and our supply chain so we actually formed a, a joint venture with uh, an irish manufacturer uh, um, uh, from Cork called it eps uh, and we worked together with them um to to develop uh, our approach to DFMA, um, and and we both learn from that. So we learn uh, specialist um, input from the manufacturing processes, what effects those uh, our design has on uh, the manufacturing process, and and then we supported them through the the digitization of their approach. So they're looking at their design tools, looking at their manufacturing tools, and and how together we, we brought these elements like you saw on those pipe galleries how we could bring those elements assemble them in a factory where they were six meters tall and and roughly 20 meters long and and be able to disassemble them bring them over on the the trucks and the ferries and then reassemble them back on site um what we actually found over over the course of the project was we got such confidence in the approach and the digital tools that we started to integrate in the um, electrical installation as well so we we put all of the lighting the instrumentation the backboards the cabling we tested all of that in the factory before um, disassembling that so that, that could be redone as well so the supply chain initially is a, a hurdle but once they've they've seen how it works in practice and the benefits that it brings to them as the, and the delivery as a whole, you, you find that they, they really start accelerating and, and now they're a source of innovation to us and ideas to us in our approach, challenging us all the time about our design and our, our delivery methodology. Okay, thank, thank you Stephen for that. Adam, uh, Adam and Martin, um, similar to you, um, you, you highlighted um, cultural issues in adopting new technologies and, and ways of working during your presentation. Did you find that was more the, the smaller to medium enterprises or was it just across the board or um, in trying to, to get them engaged? Okay, uh, Adam, if I can start here, maybe two words. Uh, <clears throat> I have, a, I would say, uh, some experience in this, in this matter in different aspects like uh, working in the uh, multinational global corporation where uh, organization is a lot bigger and this shift and transition is going uh, i would say slower and uh, uh, you can have even some kind of uh, uh, research done uh, by external uh, scientists who say that in your organization typically about three percent are innovators and about 12% are early followers. The rest is is waiting until something happens. So you can say that at the end of the day, only about 15% of the organization is ready to make any significant change, even for better. So it's it means that at the end of the day, 
uh, this might be the most challenging task to convince somebody to uh, utilize some of the technology and uh, and ideas you you put in place and of course having in mind uh, uh, excuse me one second okay sorry uh, i had some disturbance outside uh, so the 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 key thing is uh, that uh, from my side to convince this uh, experienced engineers experienced specialists in their field to try something else to try something new or to look on at some kind of a uh, activity from a different angle different perspective having in mind that sometimes in bim it means that for instance adam davis uh, my colleague in rps is doing for us extra work extra effort putting some i would say additional information to the model uh, which normally he he wouldn't do so we as a general contractor can benefit and can uh, uh, have a slight and easier uh, run on the on the construction side so uh, within one organization sometimes it is very difficult to explain people why they should do some extra stuff or why they should do something different so the overall organization or the project wins at the end of the day uh, it is uh, obvious to to consider to think of but very difficult to 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 apply and i think that this cultural difference it's uh, we have people from different nations of course in the in the organization different uh, uh, kind of approach uh, there are few nations working uh, in one team which is which is absolutely okay but uh, we need to have in mind that uh, we should apply this uh, change constantly and having this uh, i would say vision what is at the end yes so we had our top management uh, setting some kind of a vision of the organization how we what we want to achieve how we want to be uh, at the end of the day and why we are doing this beam for so so what's what's the what's the purpose what's the issue why it should be uh, implemented not only on one project in one place but across organization yes so the ultimate goal was that beam will be used by our accountants and finance guys at the end of the day who are let's say a little bit farther from the typical construction typical technical aspects of construction although uh, this information can be somehow linked and utilized in both ways so 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 uh, the aim is to engage as much uh, departments as much people uh, from the organization as possible of course in the very aspect of their their day-to-day uh, -day, uh, activity uh, I don't know Adam if you would like to add on something in culture building because this is uh, this is probably also to RPS yeah um, I suppose um, part of it is is the same as what Jonathan said and we embed it in our procurement process you know they be BIM capability assessments um, if we're going to uh, sub-consult any of the work or anything like that. But um, uh, I suppose part of it is just ensuring in the in the BEP that everyone um, everyone knows uh, everything can be integrated to ensure all the models that are produced will, will speak to each other. And you know, they're, they're, you're not going to have issues further down the line um, where where yeah. Where models aren't speaking to each other, so that that's something we you, you really need to think about when you're planning planning the project to make sure that everyone um, has has that capability to ensure that um, your yeah the the final product is what it should be. I have to add one element here that uh, uh, in my previous projects it was uh, said that we employ people by their technical competence and expertise. But we suck people because of lack of soft skills and team spirit <laughs> and this kind of element of the soft skills uh, that people with very strong technical skill skills can't cooperate with themselves and i think in bim this is a strong emphasis and strong focus on having a more integrated team during or over the whole project life cycle and having this in mind 
we need to um, uh, really put a lot of energy on proper communication and proper setting the goals and properly uh, touching these cultural aspects of your organization no matter where you are are you a designer or contractor or in asset management uh, element facility management you need to focus what is your aim and how to shape this uh, message to the employees how to engage them and of course you need to seek for these individuals it was nicely uh, seen in the previous presentations that you have some kind of a champions ambassadors people who are uh, dedicated to the change and uh, have this internal need to 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 run the change to lead the change and we should we should put emphasis on them because they will be uh, driving this uh, and this is important and of course your top management uh, that has this uh, kind of longer term vision and it will uh, be required to have this support all the time great thank thanks martin um Unfortunately, we're gonna we're gonna have to stop the the questions there. There's there's a few more there that that we uh, we can't go into right now. Um, so so we'll take them offline and and, and get them answered. Thank uh, thank you to all of those uh, panelists to um, for those answers. Very interesting. So just to finish up then, um, there are a number of ways to to stay up to date on what's happening with the alliance that you can see on your screen there. Um, also, a big thank you to Pam working in the background, uh, again, making sure everything runs smoothly on the day. Um, couldn't do it without you, thank you. Um, and lastly, thank you to uh, our presenters, uh, Jonathan, Stephen, Adam, Marchin. Thank you for some fantastic presentations. Uh, thank you for supporting us. Um, Thank you to all of you for attending and supporting us. Hope you found today useful. Uh, take care and enjoy the rest of your day. And hopefully we will see you all again in the flesh soon. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very Thank much. You. Yeah, fantastic Bye -bye. video, guys. Cheers.